When seconds count and freezing isn't an option and lives are at stake, how do you prepare to know what to do? Today's guest is Robert Montgomery. Robert was an operations officer in the CIA for 34 years and served in some of the most dangerous places in the world. He is also a former Marine and the founder of Guardwell Defense. Robert is an author and teaches training courses such as Combatives for Women, Improvised Weapons, and Street Smarts for Students and Business Persons, designed to help anyone mitigate and deal with unexpected violence. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Robert, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. All right. The pleasure's mine. Great. Can you uh, give me a little background about who you are and how you got uh, involved in what you do? Sure. Uh, So I joined the Central Intelligence Agency in 1985 and retired in 2018. And uh, throughout uh, the vast majority of my career, I uh, served overseas. So um, it was uh, interesting to actually come back and live in the States now for uh, a few years. Um, I was very fortunate in my career to have had some great training uh, over the years. And uh, as I was getting ready for, if I, if I may, get into this uh, little vignette about why I, I wrote, this, uh, wrote this book and why I thought it was important, was uh, I was getting ready to go to Afghanistan and uh, for uh, a year. And usually in that kind of assignment leading up to it, you're running around, you're doing a million and one things. You got to get the wills ready and the, make sure the insurance and the bills and the passwords and God knows what else you're forgetting, saying goodbye to people. The agency makes you take some uh, some kind of onerous training that you got to take before you go. So you're kind of juggling all these balls in, in the air. And I had mentioned to my son, who at the time was a army lieutenant, that I wanted to just run a drill uh, at home for my wife and the kids uh, in the event, uh, an unlikely event that there would be like a home intrusion type thing, just something to do before I left. And I also, we were down at Costco one day and I bought a couple of Arlo cameras and I didn't really think we needed them, but I thought, what the heck, make my wife feel, feel better. Um, so I put one camera up in, uh, by the garage and I put one up, uh, in our back deck and about two days before I was supposed to blast off, uh, my son says, Hey dad, you're going to do this drill. So like, okay, okay. So we spent about 20 minutes running through the drill. Um, okay, we're, we're all shooters in this house. So it's like, okay, where's the shotgun? Where's the ammunition? Where's the pistol? Where are you going to stand? What are we going to do with the kids? At the time, we had three young ones, uh, ages, uh, let's see, at the time, like nine, uh, seven, and four, I guess it was. Uh, we also had a teenager, 17 years old. What are we going to do with him? What's his role going to be if in this type of scenario? And we kind of goofed around for about 20 minutes and didn't take it all that seriously. Fast forward six months, and now I'm in a uh, far off eastern province uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, we had internet connection. And on my Arlo cameras, it gives you a little uh, notification when something moves. And so usually it's like a deer or a bug or something like that. And uh, I come out of the shower. It's lunchtime. Came out of the shower, and I noticed there was a motion detect on my phone. So uh, took a look, and it's 4:30 in the morning back in Virginia, and I see a, a Caucasian male standing outside my garage door, and I can see he's using the light from his cell phone to look into my garage. So my initial reaction is, "Who the hell is that? Is that my 17-year-old?" Was the initial right initial reaction. After confirming that that was not the case, uh, the way he was dressed, he had a baseball cap and his collar was up and he had a backpack and gloves. So I thought, hmm, not my son. A moment later, I get a second motion detect from the camera in the back and I see a uh, black male uh, dressed the exact same manner. And he uh, has uh, what looks like a flashlight on a handgun looking into my family room. Now, I live in a beautiful uh, college town in where crime is virtually unheard of. So at this point, I'm like, I need to call my wife. So I call her up. She gets a call from Afghanistan at 4.30 in the morning. She immediately, it's not good news, right? And I'm like, no, no, the, it's, it's, I'm fine. You're the one that's got an issue here. Go look at the cameras. I can see two guys outside. So she looks and she goes, yeah, I can see them. So I'm like, all right, go to the, go get the shotgun, load it. Tell me when you have it. So up she gets, and I can hear her messing around. She was completely calm. I was really proud of, of the way she, she did this. And I'll get, kind of get to that in a second. 
So she comes back and she goes, I'm having trouble loading it. So I'm like, forget, forget the shotgun. We'd only shot that thing once before I left. I'm like, forget the shotgun. Go get the, uh, the Glock, the pistol, rack it one time. Tell me when you have it. Now we had shot that. She had shot that a half dozen times at least. So she was more comfortable. She racks it. She comes back. Okay, I got it. I'm like, great. Go down the hall. Go stand in the doorway of the kids' room. All three little ones slept in the same room. I said, grab the teenager on the way. Uh, call 911. Speak slowly and clearly. And uh, if anybody comes up the stairs, shoot them. She goes, okay. Now, my wife is like the nicest person in the world. You know, the opposites attract, right? So literally before she hits a fly, she will apologize to us. She'll be like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then she whack. I'm like, why do you say I'm sorry? She's like, well, it wanted to live too. Is, so that's the type of person she is. But now uh, she's faced with a situation where her, her children are at risk. And man, she was all about it. I couldn't believe how, how calm uh, she was. And uh, at that time, I, I'm waiting for her to call me back. I get another motion detect. And now there's two black males on my uh, uh, deck. And I can see them testing each, each window in the door. And I still got the Caucasian male out by my garage. So I'm going nuts. And I'm thinking maybe I could call uh, the local police from uh, where I'm at. So I look on the Internet, you know, how to make an international call to the police, whatever. Make the call. And I made the mistake of saying, hey, uh, look, I'm in Afghanistan. And they go, what? You're where? And, you know, that was the mistake. So after an excruciating long explanation about that, uh, they said, OK, I understand. What's your address? And I give them the address. And they go, oh, that's the jurisdiction of the county police. Wait one minute while we transfer your call. So I'm going, I'm going nuts by this point. Uh, they transfer the call. What's your address? And I give them the address. And they go, oh, we got officers on the scene. I said, great. Did you catch anybody? And they said, no, we did not. And what we learned later was the guy out at the garage noticed the camera, which was up to his left. And he must have called the others because I saw him come up and grab that camera. And I saw that camera kind of go across the street and get thrown into the bushes. And the police just missed him. So uh, the next day, you know, my wife, uh, now the, the nerves kicked in and, and she was really uh, upset. And I started thinking, why did she perform so well in the moment? And, you know, afterwards is, is when naturally uh, she felt all the stress and the strain. And as I said earlier, I've had the great privilege of, had, of having had some fantastic training in the course of my career as an operations officer. But my family is not. And that made me think that the reason that she did well is because we spent those 20 minutes practicing six months earlier. And so she had something to revert to uh, when the moment of truth came. So then that got me interested in the idea of, OK, so if we revert to our lowest level of training, I have daughters and I have my wife and, and, and I want them to be safe. And there's more than just, you know, clearly as a CIA officer overseas, there's plenty of people that would love to behead you and kill you and, and whatever. Families are also vulnerable and they don't get that training. And then aside from that training, we've had this wacky year where, you know, civil unrest and whatever, not to mention just day to day crime. And so I started thinking, well, OK, what? kind of lessons learned could I compile for my wife and, and family? And then that idea kind of uh, turned um, into a long pontification, which wound up being the book. <laughs> yeah. and so that's kind of a long-winded answer as to, uh, as to how I, I got into this. Uh, as, a, as a case officer uh, uh, working overseas, you kind of take things for granted. And, uh, but when I go down to my college town down here, um, all you have to do is stand there for about 30 seconds and you'll see a woman run jog by wearing headphones, for example. Drives me crazy, that kind of thing. And so I address those types of issues uh, in my, my book. Hey, by the way, I want to say one more thing, too. Your website is a fantastic uh, public service. It really is. I mean, I'm listening to all the uh, the different guests that you've had there. Number one, I'm going to be uh, definitely the lowest of the low on that list of the distinguished people. But uh, you certainly uh, have done a great public service, I think, with the scams. When you were ta uh, talking about the scams, I was thinking uh, as a when you were assigned to an embassy, you often, well, not often, about once, twice a year, you do embassy duty. And that means at nighttime, Whenever usually it's, it's a drunk uh, American or somebody gets sick or they get mugged or their passport's lost or something like that, 
But um, when I was in Malaysia, I was surprised at how many, I'd look at the logbook and how many calls we would get in the course of a week of Americans, usually lonely people who were being scammed by somebody they met on the internet who was now traveling or working and suddenly they had so supposedly they had an accident and they're at the hospital, but the hospital won't treat them unless they get the money. This scam came up again and again and again. And it's heartbreaking to have to tell some of these folks, you know, very nice, well meaning people. Oh, my friend is in trouble, but I can't reach him, but I sent the money and can you help me find him and this kind of thing. And uh, really heartbreaking. So what you're doing is a tremendous public service. Well, thank you. I mean, uh, same for you. I think what we're doing is trying to use our experiences to to make the world a better place, to use our platforms, to uh, try to save people from those types of things, which is, which is exactly what we're doing today as well. Amen. So – I, in the in the book, you I was kind of reading through a little bit of it. And thank you so much for sending the book. And I, I really like the, uh, the the quote that you put uh, in the inscription for me. And I can't read the last name from David. Oh, uh, Hackworth, David Hackworth, David Hackworth. If you find yourself in a fair fight, you didn't plan properly. Yeah, yeah <laughs> to, David Hackworth, absolutely. To to me, it's like I thought about that. I'm like. You're always asking, you're always thinking like, oh, I want a fair fight. And like, well, maybe I don't really want, if I'm going to be in a fair fight, I don't really want it to be a fair fight. I want to have the advantage going into that. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I wanted to talk about a couple of th- things in your book and we'll, we'll work these into situational awareness. And the first thing you, you talk about is fear and knowing it and not being controlled by it. And that kind of seems to me is to kind of set the foundation of how you can be situationally aware. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we were if we're sitting here nonchalantly uh, drinking coffee and pontificating about things, but if a bomb suddenly went off, our heart rates would go from like a resting heart rate of like 80 beats uh, per minute, and it would shoot up uh, like in a proverbial heartbeat, we'd be up to like 220 or, or something like that. So um, Dave Grossman, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, in his book, I think it was On Killing, did a really interesting uh, study about the correlation between your heart rate and your ability to uh, have fine motor skills and even your ability to think. And so uh, he, he, the the military has come up with the, with the statistics that at about 115 to 145 beats per minute of your heart is where a soldier uh, executes his duties. Well, when it starts getting above 145, you start losing your ability to use fine motor skills, uh, your heart's beating fast, uh, you're, you're breathing, you probably have been holding your breath, so your, your breathing is uh, is rapid. You may start experiencing tunnel vision. Uh, you know, police officers, when they get to a, a scene, and within eight seconds, now they're suddenly in a fight for their lives. They experience uh, tunnel vision, they can experience auditory exclusion where they can't hear uh, things other than what the immediate threat is. And uh, once you start getting up into the 200, 220 beats per minute, that's when the animal brain takes over and is blind panic uh, at at that point. Uh, So if you can under, uh, and I'm no, you know, I'm not a physician or any, anything close to that. So, but if you can understand the, the physical effects and the psychological effects of fear, then hopefully when it happens to you, you can understand that. If this is what's happening to me, this is what I need to do to to, to re- lower my heart rate. And so uh, chances are you, me, and your listeners are doing this right now as we're breathing, right? And if you think about breathing, every endeavor that we do, whether uh, it's martial arts or tennis or that godforsaken game of golf or uh, you know, whatever it is, swimming, uh, yoga, uh, meditation. It's all about breathing. And when you, and, and probably you've experienced this, everybody has at some point where they come upon an accident and immediately you get out of that car to go help. And, and immediately, you, you know, you're, you can feel your heart rate going up. What, what am I going to see in the car? Or if you see other people who are now paralyzed by what they've seen at the accident and all they can do is, uh, you know, moan and lament what's happened and not do anything. If you understand that, then understand that breathing, controlling your breath, taking you know two or three count breath in, hold it for two or three counts, 
breathe out two or three counts. Um, again, Dave Grossman and, and Lauren Christensen uh, coined the phrase combat breathing. And that's simply all it is. It's just breathe in, breathe out. That immediately starts to lower after a couple cycles your heart rate. And hopefully you can get out of that animal brain and bring it down to uh, so, to a level where you can make a, a, a decision, right? And and that's kind of a, the other kind of aspect of this. You know, when something happens, something happens, and immediately we enter this kind of decision loop where you, it's first it's like disbelief. I can't believe this is happening. You know, followed by what should I do? And followed finally by hopefully action. If we look at some of the poor victims of 9-11 who were stuck in the towers. They never got out of that second one. What should I do? Well, I'll just sit here and wait. You know, the fire department will, will take care of it. It's not as bad as I, I think it is or as I, I, I just will ignore it and hope that it won't, won't happen. So this is kind of the human psychology, uh, I think, of fear. And so if you understand that that exists, then you stand a chance of working through it and getting to that decision more quickly. So, so I have a question about about the the kind of the combat breathing, and uh, is this the sort of thing by uh, practicing it in non stressful situations, like okay, three deep breaths, calm down, inhale, in that you've kind of build that muscle memory of that behavior and being able to execute it when you're in a more stressful situation. I think you're absolutely right, um, but it's not necessary as long as you know the the concept and understand that concept um, and can draw upon that concept. And when you're startled, uh, I think you'll be fine. But, but yeah, it's just getting over that startle, right? Getting out of that. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to me. You know. There was an interesting story I heard as a, as a young trainee about a Egyptian general and he was marked for assassination and he was driving his car and a, a vehicle came up in front of him blocked his path. Another one came up behind him and the vehicle in front, two guys got out with AK 47s and they walked up to the general's car and just shot, 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 shot. And then at the end, um, one of them takes a, uh, like a Molotov cocktail, throws it in the car and, uh, finishes the job. Afterwards with the autopsy, they discovered that, uh, not a single bullet had pierced his body, but he died from the flames. And so what's interesting about that is, you know, here, that's a kind of a, an extreme example of, of he, I can't believe this is happening. And then he got stuck in what should I do? And never got out of it. Um, you know, at that point, combat breathing, probably you're gonna, it's not going to help too much at that point, but, you know, knowing to hit the accelerator might've made a difference. Yeah. I know there was a, there was a news story. This is probably Oh gosh, 20, 25 years ago, near me, they uh, there's a railroad, uh, a car, uh, a road crossing a railroad tracks, and the, this particular area, the traffic would often back up such that there's a street light, and you know you're not supposed to stop on the tracks, but occasionally someone would stop on the tracks while they're waiting for the light to turn, and a train was coming, the gates came down, and there was a woman in her car. And even though people were like, she was clearly panicking and honking, like the awareness to, and people are telling her, get out of your car, get out of your car. But she stayed in her car and ultimately was hit and killed by the train. Because she didn't want to crash through the gate, right? She didn't want to, or someone was right in front of her, but like that thought process of what do I do? Well, get out of the car. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, there's, there's example after example of, of uh, that kind of thing. So I think just awareness of it. Uh, can increase your chances of of living through the day. You know, make the difference between being above dirt or six feet under. So, so you talked about awareness. So what are like what are the things that we should be aware of when we're at home, out and about, traveling? So it, the, this whole thing about situational awareness has really kind of taken off in the last couple of years. I start seeing more and more of it, which you know, which is a good thing. Um, from a Case officer's point of view, you want to be uh, situationally aware simply for doing your job, which is to uh, collect information for the U.S. government and to protect the person that's giving you that information. From a citizen's point of view, really, it's the same thing. And what you first, I think, first need to understand is, is that you cannot be alert all the time. 
this is what leads to PTSD from uh, soldiers in combat where they are hyper alert in the combat zone. They come back and they can't uh, relax. And so that impacts their sleep, that impacts uh, their relationships with, uh, with people, that impacts on decision making, and it kind of snowballs out. So you cannot be hyper vigilant all the time. And that's great. What, so what you do need to understand is when to be hypervigilant and when not to be hypervigilant. So for, for the average citizen, when I'm sitting in my house, um, I, obviously I'm, this is my safe space, um, aside from the story I told you earlier. But I did fantasize for months about them coming back when I was home. I will say that. Um, <laughs> and I'm almost over that fantasy now. Uh, so understand that when you're in a house, okay, you can relax. When you go out in the street, when I open the door, I just look a little bit more than I would otherwise. I, again, I live in a beautiful neighborhood. I don't really expect issues here, but my situational awareness just goes up a little bit. I get into my car. Here's something I, uh, I, I picked up uh, actually from a, a British friend of mine uh, who was a counterpart of mine. And he talks about the, the two feet in, the two feet out uh, rule for cars, which is a, a great one. If you get into your car, and you plant both feet on the ground, that forces you to look out as you sit back into your car, two, two feet in. When you get out of your car, you put two feet out, that forces you again to be facing out, and that gives you an opportunity to just see anything that's there. All right, so you get in your car, driving to wherever. Um, in a CIA point of view, you'd be looking for anything suspicious, anybody that wanted to kill you, they're going to do it by the house or by your work or, you know, this kind of thing. But from the average citizen, uh, you know, we thank God we don't have to worry about IEDs or bombs or, you know, this kind of thing. Um, but what you can do is be alert to what's happening around you. And especially uh, when you get to a stop sign, this is where bad things happen at a traffic light at a stop sign. And there's a bazillion uh, examples of this on uh, YouTube of people being robbed in various parts of the world at stop lights and stop signs. So, okay, if you know that, all right, so you're going to be a little bit more vigilant. Um, I always leave a car length, at least a car length uh, between my car and the car in front of me. Uh, because if I have to use my very convenient battering ram, my three ton vehicle or four ton vehicle, I got no problem with that. And uh, all you got to do is point towards the, the, the wheel well of the car in front of you or behind you, put the foot all the way to the ped uh, met pedal, to the metal there, all the way down, accelerate through. All our driving lives were taught, don't hit something, don't hit anybody, right? Maybe that was part of the, the woman's uh, uh, incapacitation at the railroad track. And, oh, I can't go through that gate. Yeah, you can go through the gate. Yeah, you can crash into that car. Even to the point of, uh, you know, some places uh, when I worked in Southeast Asia quite a bit, if you put a car length between you and a car there, it'll immediately fill up like uh, mosquitoes under a poncho with, you know, guy people on motorbikes, right? But yeah, I have to decide in my, in my mind if I'm going to get shot at or somebody's going to come up and try to, to kill me while I'm waiting there, what am I going to do? Now, am I going to like not run, you know, not try to force my way out? Well, I am going to try to force my way out, hopefully not crunching a bunch of people on the way. But chances are, if something happens, crowds have an amazing awareness uh, of understanding what's happening. And a lot of those people are going to be getting out of Dodge as it's happening. Sometimes all we need is those uh, split seconds, tenths of a second to see what's happening and make a decision. All right. So back to situational awareness. If I'm on foot, when I'm, I go out to a, a you know city domestic travel, I'm in my hotel room. I'm pretty safe and happy there. I open the door. Now things start to change a little bit. I just start to pay a little bit of attention. If I see people, um, I look at their hands and um, just not in a paranoid uh, way, but just in a commonsensical way. Um, I go down uh, into the lobby. Uh, when I Certainly when I get on the elevator, I pay attention to who's getting on the elevator. And I'm just going to sidetrack for a moment here, but um, how many uh, women in your life do you know, daughters, uh, friends, wives, who don't want to be rude when the door opens, elevator door opens, they see somebody on that elevator and they're like, oh, I don't want to be rude. I, it's probably nothing. I'll just get on. I'm like, no, be rude. If some, 
if that door opens and you see a guy standing there and you don't like the way he looks, it's okay. Be rude. Uh, tram, you know, go, Trump, uh, stomp on his ego a little bit, no problem. Better safe than sorry. You get out to the street. Now my awareness is going to go up a little bit more if I'm in a, on a city street. Uh, when I walk by alleys, I'm not going to be hugging the wall so I'm closest to the alley. I'm going to be stepping out a little bit. If I see people standing around, um, I'm not going to be politically correct and worry about profiling. If I see a guy standing there, a couple guys standing there with, with hoodies on, doing nothing in particular at the entrance to the subway, that's going to catch my attention. If I'm at the ATM and, and uh, somebody comes in, clearly that's going to catch my attention. And that's not the time to be politically correct or to worry about hurting uh, somebody's feelings. Uh, really, that's, you know, generations, uh, our ancestors have survived being eaten by the saber-toothed tiger because they it, he, they listened to these little feelings that they had of, of danger signals. And we've kind of lost that in society. Uh, we're, we're worried about how people feel and not hurting their feelings. And I'm not saying you got to walk around like, an, you know, being impolite uh, idiot, of course. But what I'm simply saying is listen to the little signals that you get. If something makes you feel uncomfortable, it it should. And listen to that. If you're a woman uh, or a man and somebody comes up to you at your car as you're getting in and they say, hey, man, you got the time. Well, who doesn't have access to time these days in this day and age? Immediately, you should be thinking something's up. Um, you know, if you are walking and you hear a quickening of footsteps behind you, turn around and look. If you see on security cameras how people get attacked and, and this kind of thing, it, it happens very often from behind. And the last few paces, the, the bad guy will run up. He will put his body weight into hitting the person uh, from behind. You hear a quickening of paces. Turn around and look. If you're a woman and some guy is insistent on helping you with your packages or whatever, that's a sign. Predators love the hunt. And they understand that people are reluctant to say no or appear rude. And they also understand that in order to, to do what they want to do, they need to be within arm's length of their victim. So all these types of ploys, do you have a, you know, do you have a cigarette? What time is it? Let me help you with that. All these should be, should raise your antenna to be ready to fight for your life. And I would contend that sometimes just a modicum of forethought can make all the difference. All right. So we continue our, our, our journey and, uh, you know, jogging women that we mentioned, I alluded to this earlier. I can go downtown here, my little beautiful town and probably eight, out of 10 women that I see jogging will have uh, the headphones. I read about a, a case of a woman hiking the Appalachian Trail last summer. And much to her surprise, a bear came running out and literally knocked her over and continued running down the path. Lord only knows what that bear was running from. That would be another thing. But uh, literally knocked her down. And it turns out that she didn't hear it because she was wearing headphones out in the wild. So, um, you know, she's lucky she didn't become part of the food chain that day. Um, so all that kind of points to situational awareness. There's nothing really uh, uh, spectacular about it uh, or, or sneaky or, or extremely uh, cool or anything. It's just a, a, a simple awareness. When my son went to a city college, uh, I, I remember we walked together. I said, come on, we're going to walk from your apartment, which was off campus, down to the campus. And as we walked, I would point things out. I say, like, you see that, see the bum over there? I just don't like the way he's standing there. Let's cross the street. We're not any less of a man or uh, nothing like that. We're just being cautious enough to avoid a situation. And so we kind of went block by block that way. And it's, it's interesting to me that he always kind of remembered that. To me, it was just kind of a routine, wasn't so exciting kind of a, a walk. But he remembers that and uh, appreciates that. So 
that's something uh, that I'll, that I do with all my kids. And, and I think it's important. It's, it's, and now I'm, I'm just uh, losing my train of thought here, but uh, okay. So that's the situation awareness. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's no, like, it's not a big CIA secret. It's nothing more than being aware when you should and relaxing when you can. It, it, that kind of reminds me of the time my wife and I were up in San Francisco. We were heading from our hotel to some restaurant and, you know, we were, well, we're going to, we're going to walk it as we're, as we're walking, we're getting you know further from the restaurant. We're like, okay, this, the, the, the quality of the neighborhoods are getting a little lower. There's, you know, kind of the people milling around on the corners a little bit more. And we get to this one intersection. There's just, there's, there's quite a few people. It's like, mm, you know, it's, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. There, there shouldn't be this many people just kind of milling around. This seems kind of, kind of odd. And at one point, I hear somebody shout, someone in the neighborhood shout something, and about half the people on the street go running away. And about a minute later, a police car comes. And I'm like, okay, we're not walking back this way. And you know the pity of that is San Francisco was such a fantastic city not so long ago. Still some great neighborhoods. We're, we're, we're not trying to disparage San Francisco. But it was but it was the sort of things like as we got further off the beaten path – we saw, you know, we started to notice things degrading and we were like, okay, what, like you were saying, well, let's walk on this side of the street where there's less people. Let's get a little further away from. Yeah, good for you. I mean, that show. Uh, suspicious characters hanging out on door stoops and whatnot. Good for you. That's perfect because m- many people would be inclined to be, well, I don't want to be seen as, you know, being judgmental or. I'm just imagining it. I mean, usually people that are about to face a horrible situation that I can't believe this is happening can also get stuck in that. I can't believe this is happening as they're being stabbed at the ATM. Why me? Why me? There's no answer to that. Now's not the time to ask why me. Now's the time to get to that decision and do something about it. So situational awareness, I think, will mitigate 95% of all issues. You can, you can, you can avoid every kind of problem just being aware of what's happening around you do you think there are is there like a set of uh, of tips that you have for when people are traveling i know you know hopefully we're we're coming out of covid here and people are going to shake off their i haven't gone out of my house in 2 years i'm i'm going to go to another country i'm going to go to another state i'm going to go to somewhere i haven't been before because i just need to get out of dodge I think that opens up to a lot of opportunities for criminals to take advantage of those people. What should travelers be kind of watching for when they're traveling? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things. First of all, I would uh, register with the state department and God bless the state department. They're one of the most bureaucratic organizations uh, anywhere. Please. My state colleagues don't think ill of me for saying that, but they're really good about one thing, which is when you register with them, if there's an issue in the country, is there unrest, political unrest, or demonstrations, or what have you, they'll contact you. And if it really, if the situation goes to hell, there is a they'll uh, contact you to extract you. So registering uh, with the State Department when you visit someplace is definitely a, a good idea. The other thing is now we're kind of entering. You know, we got two concerns: we got the terrorism realm, and we've got uh, the uh, the crime uh, issue. And so. You have to be cognizant of both those things. Uh, people who were uh, in Bali in uh, in 2002 were not thinking about uh, car bombs when they went out to the bars, uh, Patty's Pub uh, that night. So traveling overseas, I think, in short, the best advice would be, as an American, avoid places where foreigners tend to gather or known to gather. Sometimes that's easier said than done. If you go to uh, some of the more third world type environments, you're going to want to stay in the, the, the Hilton or the Marriott hotels or what have you. Fine. But then a couple things. Don't get rooms on uh, the first or second floor. Um, don't go to the dining room at the peak hours. People who will want to do harm uh, will generally attack the lobby, the restaurants next to the lobby, and they'll tend to do it at, at those peak hours. Don't uh, you can spot an American, you know, a, a, a thousand meters away, 
uh, based on the way we dress and uh, oftentimes, sometimes the way we comport ourselves. I'm not saying don't be yourself, but maybe tone down uh, the Americanisms, right? So how many people overseas do you see wearing uh, cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, just as an example? You know, zip. But if you see that somewhere, you say, ah, that's an American. Hawaiian t-shirt, uh, must be an American. Uh, you know, this type of thing. So uh, trying to maintain a lower profile, maybe stay at uh, hotels that are not uh, U.S. owned, if, if the U.S. is a target. Some places in the world, like Indonesia, the, the Australians are more of a target than uh, Americans, which is uh, almost kind of refreshing, uh, <laughs> being, having been a target for so many years. Uh, and I love my Australian uh, colleagues. But yeah, they have to contend with that uh, more. The Bali bombing, they were trying to kill um, uh, Americans, but to them, Australians and Americans all look the same, must be the same, doesn't matter. Hotels, if you're a business traveler and you go to a place like China, Russia, uh, anywhere where there's an authoritarian government and you take your computer and uh, your cell phone, you need to assume that your electronics will be compromised. So if there's anything on your computer that you don't want a host government to know, don't take it. Um, I'm going to make a plug here. There's a company, a UK company, um, that was started by um, the British Secret Intelligence Service, a friend of mine. Uh, called Edson Tiger. And they actually have a, a very extensive uh, online course for travelers, business travelers, um, students, quite quite ex uh, extensive, kind of captures all the little tips and tricks that I learned over the course of a, of a career in a one little uh, one little package. So if you have any listeners who are interested in Taking something like that, I would highly recommend it. Edson Tiger is the, the name of that company. We'll make sure to uh, link to it in the show notes. That way people can find it. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, they do a nice job. So, I mean, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, you want to try to blend in. You don't want to stick out. Uh, Americans, uh, we tend to wear backpacks and, and things like that. If you go to Southeast Asia, everybody wears their backpack in the front. It looks ridiculous, but they do it for a reason, right? Because... Uh, people, uh, they, people uh, rob them when the backpack is on the back. Um, so yeah, that would be the main thing. Uh, Americans should understand that they can always call the their local U.S. embassy when they're overseas. Uh, again, as uh, the duty officer there, I experienced many times of people losing passports or getting mugged or, uh, or even worse on uh, the worst occasions, uh, passing away, and then we have to contact the the next of kin and this kind of thing. Uh, but um, yeah, definitely. Definitely keep in touch with the U.S. Embassy when you go overseas. You know, I've often heard we should be, you know, making sure that we have a uh, paper, paper uh, address for the hotels that we're staying at, the, the phone numbers of important things uh, written on paper in our pockets because if our cell phone gets stolen, uh, that's kind of, uh, as Americans or probably a lot of people around the world, that's our lifeline. And if we lose that piece of tech, we're really kind of uh, up the creek without a paddle. Absolutely. Copies of your passport uh, as well. Paper copies. Um, here, you know, one thing that uh, people don't think about that much, uh, I know I didn't until I started hitting uh, kind of my ripe old age now, is when you go somewhere, uh, understand to your benefit to understand if something happens to me, which hospital should I go to? And I'll give you an example. I was in Riyadh and um it turns out that there were only. Uh, it turned out that the best hospital for a foreigner to go to in Riyadh was the German hospital that was there, because they uh, you were more likely to uh, be able to interact with doctors who spoke English and accepted insurance and this kind of thing. So that's a minor thing, but uh, it's minor until you need it. Uh, so I would suggest uh, to travelers to investigate that. And a lot of times the uh, U.S. Embassy website can give you information uh, on that. And those are those are the kind of things where it doesn't take a lot of research to do when you're not in a stressful situation. But if you're tr in the moment trying to figure out what hospital should I go to, the 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 U.S. centric response is going to be, well, I just want to go to the nearest one because I know I'm going to get good care. That may not be the case when we're traveling overseas. 
Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And that kind of brings in a whole, uh, the idea about, uh, I think every citizen should spend a little time learning the basics of first aid uh, so that they can uh, stop a bleed, put on a tourniquet. Um, sometimes a lot of places overseas, uh, ambulance, their only job is to pick up, pick you up and drive you to the hospital. They have not, unlike the U.S., where our, our paramedics are superbly trained at, at giving you that initial care. It doesn't happen overseas. So being responsible for yourself, I think, is, is an important uh, aspect to preparedness for traveling overseas and maybe having a tourniquet, having some ACE bandages, um, just just taking the time to learn the basics of, of, of first aid, I think, are very important. Yeah, I was uh, traveling once, and uh, one of the people that we were traveling with, uh, we were traveling overseas, had uh, an allergic reaction, and so we, you know, asked, you know, asked the asked the hotel, can you can you call an ambulance? And the response was, "What's an ambulance?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, we need a. Do you know what a hospital is? Uh huh. Okay, how do we get to the hospital? Taxi. <laughs> like, okay." <laughs> So, like, it's good to know that, like, okay, there, you know, if there isn't an ambulance service, to know kind of what you're getting and know what Plan B is going to be if you can't get an ambulance right away. Yeah, that's for sure. That's yeah. That's, I hope everything turned out okay. Everything was, was, was turned out perfectly well, and surprisingly, the the cost of everything uh, without insurance was less than what it would have been with insurance in the U.S. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation, isn't it? But yeah, same thing. Malaysia hospitals were very uh, affordable and uh, the rooms were like hotel rooms, you know, three, four star hotel rooms. Really nice. I'm like, why can't that be the case in the U.S.? But that's a whole different topic of which I know nothing about. But I, I know nothing about that topic either. So if people want to find your book, the title is Seconds. To Live or Die, with the subtitle of Life-Setting Lessons from a Former CIA Officer. I assume every, you can find it Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere that uh, paperback books and hardcover books are sold. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, or uh, on my website as well. I got some here if they uh, want me to write some uh, pontification on there like I did for you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, happy to do it. Yeah. So where can people find you online? What's your website? And are you on social media? So yes, uh, guardwelldefense.com is uh, my website because uh, a lot of what I do, we talked about situational awareness and that takes care of 95% of issues in life. The other 5% is fighting for your life and that's been a, a hobby and interest of mine for many years. So the website is uh, geared towards uh, how to fight in the worst 15 seconds of the worst day of your life. Um, certainly uh, Facebook, same thing, guardwelldefense.com and uh, you know, Instagram, guardworlddefense.com, all the, the usual suspects. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today, Robert. Chris, thank you. Uh, I really appreciated the opportunity. And again, thank you for the public service that uh, you perform. So that's great. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Prey Podcast. If you found this episode actionable or noteworthy, leave a comment and a review at easyprey.com slash review. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Robert Montgomery can be found at easyprey.com slash 77.